Hello everyone. Before I bring you Priscilla, um, and before I start talking like a 17th century English person, I do want to discuss a few of the historical choices that I've made, uh, especially since I'm performing this for Priscilla's own descendants. This is historical fiction. So this is based very strongly on the documentary record of Priscilla's life, given, given what we know of it, of the Mullins family and the research that's been done, uh, especially recently, on the Mullinses and their town of Dorking, and also on Plymouth Colony as a whole. Uh, so I'm basing it very closely on that research, but because I am telling a story uh, and we want to imagine what Priscilla's experience actually was, I have had to make definitive interpretive choices about a few different unanswered historical questions. One of the biggest of those is the identity of Priscilla's mother, because we don't know for sure who her mother was. For the purposes of this program, I have chosen to follow the research that was done most recently in Dorking itself, indicating that Priscilla may have been the daughter of William Mullen's first wife. Um, in this case, I've chosen to name her Elizabeth because Priscilla had an older sister by that name who died young, um, but we don't know if that's the case and to imagine that Alice Mullins was Priscilla's stepmother, but would have been the person who really raised her for most of her life. So that is a dramatic choice, but it is based on some historical research that is sound. I've also had to decide uh, whether Priscilla could read. I've chosen to interpret that she could, because it was very common for reforming Protestants, especially to teach their daughters to read so that they could read scripture. It was, however, much less common to teach girls to write in the 16th and 17th century. And so I make no mention of Priscilla writing for that reason. I also had to make an executive decision, if you will, about the Mullins' religious feelings. We don't know for sure whether they had Puritan or separatist sympathies. I have chosen to interpret that they did, but that they had not themselves separated from the Church of England. So they are people who are sympathetic to the goals of the separatists, the Leiden Congregation of Pilgrims, but they are not quite that radical themselves in this version. Um, and I also had to decide when Alice and Priscilla's brother Joseph died. Um, we don't have death dates for them. We know when William Mullins probably died because of the date of his will. Um, but I have had to follow the guesswork of historians of Plymouth Colony in making that choice. So those are the uh, main fictional choices that I've made, but they are all based uh, in the real history. And so without further ado, I will bring you Priscilla. Well, this is what you're expecting, is it not? Black and white, crisp and plain, ink on paper, a solid shadow cast on a whitewashed wall. But whether cast by our candles and rush lights, or by the archer glare of your bright lamps, shadows are always more than shadows. It is a real person casts a shadow. And however blurred or distant, the image that casts that shadow may become, still I think that we may be seen in true color and in shades of gray. Sheep's gray and matter red, violet, yellow, green, woad blue, true, costly, dignified black, glare and white, bleached in the sun and softened with an hundred washes. That's how I would have you see us who came before ye. All men and women, from Adam and Eve, are a pile of laundry ready for the wash. My children, these are the times of our lives that I bring unto you now. Listen to the life that I have known, and as I am your mother, hear me true. For though I am your mother, are not mothers women also? A girl, a wife, an aged dame, all these have I and my own sisters been, who dared our lives together to cross the ocean on that little rackety wine-smelling ship and lived lived above one year past to tell the tale of these wondrous works. God promised Abraham long ago that his descendants would number as many as the stars in the sky. And many times have I looked up at the heavens and wondered how many, millions mayhaps, 
that promise might entail to a man and wife chosen to live all they knew, to venture into a world they never saw and start afresh on a promise from above. Now I look to you, my stars in the sky, that you might hear my voice and know who truly gave you birth. We must again be captives in Babylon, ere we can venture into the promised land. But that Babylon was our own fair island, the nation and commonwealth of England, our green and pleasant cradle in the sea. I was born in the last years of the, of the Queen's reign. The old Queen, that is, Elizabeth, ruled solely and in her own right all the days of my parents, full back to my grandparents' youthful days. But I am a daughter of King James's reign. I am a daughter of no main estate, my father a shoemaker turned merchant, known and trusted and depended upon in the little town where we was born. We call it Dorkin, in the county of Surrey. My mother died when I was little, and I remember her face but dimly, as I remember running towards green hills that seemed as vast to me as an ocean might to a mariner. Ma'am and the, and the hills are all one, a kindly blur of velvet green and soft English rain and clay. I remember her voice better as I toddled through our kitchen garden, calling out as I stumbled, Priscilla! My sister Sarah became a little mother to my steps. My brother, William, ten years my senior and very grand to my small gaze. It was my stepmother, Alice, I called mother most of my, youth, of my childhood days, as she it was that taught me to read. First, the yarn book, the primer, the Bible, and stood me up to learn my catechism. All the arts of housewifery I learned in that big house, the manor of Dorkin, four bays wide on the ice street, that my father bought when my brother Joseph was a little boy, unbreached and still at home. We could step straight out to market or shops, or better still, to church. St. Martin's, that is, up the I Street at the very center, standing as it has, or some church like it as, since William Conqueror surveyed the land. So it is, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Little did I know that the very, as a small girl in an itchy ruff and good red shoes, that the very words that I urge every Sunday stuck like thorns in my father's art. My father craved a simpler way, not befuddled by ceremony or trick and tricks of grandeur, but something clear and pure as to the apostles twas, and their heirs in the catacombs of Rome. I am named for one of those first Christians, Priscilla, wife of Aquila. Tent makers were expelled from Rome and went into grace, and are spoken of by the Apostle Paul. I am not the first Priscilla Mullins of my father's house, and I will not be last. It was some time before I realized that mother and father were not like others, we, that we were something different, apart, always searching for something that others cared not for. Sure, we all went to church on Sundays, but after church, many played at idle games, while mother had me read aloud the Bible, translated by godly men in exile in Geneva, when the bloody queen burned the brave martyrs, men and women true, as father read us from Master Fox's book, telling all the tales of those purifying souls driving popish heresy out of doors. I tried to teach the other girls the catechism when I did perceive their lack of knowledge, but some of them laughed and scorned at me, saying, we have enough of that a Sunday, Silla. I knew that Father had friends in London town who were more of our mind in matters godly, and that Father would converse and pray with them when he went up to the great city to trade. But that not more than a handful of days. When I was about ten years of age, Father took us up to London. We stayed with Father's friends in Grace Church Street, and when he was not talking trade within, we saw the sights. So many churches. 
We wanted those winding narrow walks. Church bells chiming in close time, streets apart. Streets crowded upon streets, men upon men, and base in the lanes and the market squares. But luck and a stench so deep that I would not smell the light until I had been six months below deck on that ship. But London, it was worth the stench. My shoes got filthy, but my eyes were full, and, and my ears and my, my nose with more than stench. Draper shops with smooth damask and wool satin. Spices all the way from far Cathay. Strange seeds and squashes from the Indies. I and jewels and silver at the goldsmiths. I asked father if any of it had come back with old Sir Francis Drake in the Golden Island, and he laughed and said, perhaps. Then he took his good beaver hat from his head and said, this hat comes from the Indies too. Knows you that, daughter? Father, you know it comes from your own friend, Master Carter, here in London. You told me so. <laughs> well, remember it, daughter. But where comes this pelt from? From a beaver. A strange furry base with a fine lush coat that the Indians kill for us across the say. They traded us for pretty babes, like those colored glass ones you admired in that shop we passed. Such trinkets, their wild and uncivil taste, do much esteem. But, Father, does that mean that we, that we trade the furs of these soft base too cheaply? Doth we trade fair? Daughter, we trade wisely, and such wisdom is the way to wealth for those of us as have the nose to seek it. And then he said, would you like to see one, an Indian? Father, you know I can't go across the say. <sighs> no, daughter, there is one of the mirror. They put him out to stand in the market square. They say such a wild, untamed man makes a fearsome sight to be old, but fair not. Father, a real Indian, all the way from Virginia. Father, I want to see the wild man too. Patience, children, tis a few streets this way. And so through the streets of London, we went tripping and jostling and bustling, and I blush to say, pushing, till my brother and I came through a crowd, and we saw him. The tallest man I had ever seen, naked, not even a shirt upon his back, his skin like polished bronze, not black like the moors I'd seen walking about the city streets. He stood as still and solidly as hewn stone, even, even when some wanton boys ran up to him and poked his side. And then he looked down at me. Welcome, welcome. I wondered at him. A gentleman near us remarked he looked a princely creature withal, and wondered if such a one were not king of his own island before he, re before he were brought off in chains a slave. It would be years before I understood that, yes, of his own island was this man rightful prince. Years before I knew that he had kin, who all believed him dead or lost to hope, but that one day he would return again. Years before I understood, he had a name. His name is Epinau, Sachem of Aquina, and he hates us still. It would be many years before I heard aught of America again. Word came back from time to time, dread stories, back across the water from Virginia. And, one, and once or twice I heard my father speaking with his friends about some godly folk far off in the low countries, English, and fled away most bravely to gather their church and to worship rightly. Now planning with some London men father knew to plant a colony across the say, and to build a new and right foundation in that wild and untamed land. And I took it for some curious news withal, but idle withal, not touching ourselves. Then the comet came. A maid of sixteen years I was, when that great green star came streaming, fire in the heavens with its long tail aglow, a fox's brush lit with burning sulphur. Folks whispered the great star portended all manner of evils, but my father listened in a different light, 
to, God, to learned men saying that the Christ would near come again to us Christians, followers of the true church, and brought the gospel into many a dark and unknown land. And where did this great comet point towards? Northwest from Guinea to the frozen north, this cold and blazing star laid clear our path. I began to realize that my father would never be contented with our lot, and that he meant to hazard our own selves on the prospect of planting across the say. But for that trip up to London once, all I knew was darkens lanes and fields, the smell of leather in my father's shop, the town pump in the ice street gossips, the solid oak of the King's Arms Tavern, our clay streets after rain, the chime of bells, my brother William and sister Sarah, wet and well settled, helped us prepare, and to the port we journeyed together to meet with lighting saints and London strangers, with whom we'd hazard our lives on say and shore. The ship, Mayflower, under Captain Jones, had to turn back twice. We gained more planters, as our sister ship, Speedwell, lived not up to her name. I watched the lizard's lighthouse winking out in the fog. In the last of all, I had never once seen, seen the open say, and even before we left the sight of land, I loved and hated it. The rolling billows like an endless field, or a wrinkled blanket ne'er quite spread out, that I loved. But the pitch and toss, the smell of urine and vomit and worse. Oh, we tried to keep clean, with success, but delicate stomachs must not set foot below the decks of a ship. Sick we were, by turns prayerful or miserable or both. One of the sailors raged and scorned at us, but his laughter turned to groans, and he was the first over the side in his hammock. Autumn is no time to cross the Atlantic. And we paid the price for our manly gall, as God's hand alone held us up, crested mountainy waves, an ark with no error at. We could see nothing, hear nothing, but water roaring and seeping through every crevice. Not seeing was worse, perhaps. The great beam buckled and seemed like to break in twain, and as I thought, plunge us into the main. But our men and Master Jones's men raised it up with the great screw the saints brought out of Holland, and it held fast. By God's will alone, we resolved to proceed. About that time, our friend and neighbor, John Owland, fell overboard, and by God's grace, seized an alliard, saved him. He married my good friend, Bess Tilly, and managed our trade in furs alongside my own John. Such is providence. One morning, the shout went up, Land! Land -o! And we all rushed to see the long in sight, glimmering on the horizon. But yet, as we drew near, it remained a sliver, sand like a flat arm lying on the say, a vast strand such as none even the coastal folk were used to see. We fell into rips and bars, currents and breakers. And the master said, the French and Dutch call this place Malabar but the English, Cape Cod. Far north we were from the, from the most northern parts of Virginia, far outside our remit to plant. And so our menfolk, after much disquiet, gathered a civil body politic to knit our small commonwealth together in what we hoped was a legal manner. By the Cape's rough waters were we compelled to take shelter in its great oak of an arbor, and I stared. The new world. No inns, no houses to seek succor in. An hideous and desolate wilderness filled with wild beasts and wild men. Some are done, and all things stand upon us with a weather beaten face withal. The master and his crew impressed upon our menfolk that we must find a place to stay. And so as our men set off upon the long shore, we women folk washed our body linens in salt water, watching always in fear lest we be set upon by Indians. 
But when our men returned, they brought wonders. Corn of many colors, and wholesome veins such as all had never seen before. And I asked that young cooper, Goodman Alden, did you meet with the Indians to trade? No, Mistress Priscilla, we found their villages and even some graves, but the wild men fled from us. And so we took that which was needful, and so we will make satisfaction later. That seemed not plain dealing, but I questioned it not. And then spake Captain Standish. They set upon us too, very warlike. They fired arrows at us like a nail store. I saw one lusty fellow, no less valiant, stand with an apple musket shot, but our lads put him to flight. I thought then of the man long years ago in the marketplace, and I wondered if these wild men thought that we were come to stale them all the way. I was glad to lave that harsh and weary shore by the edge of the world, so it did seem. But it was dark December, ground frozen and snow upon it, when at long last we came into the bay that we call Plymouth. We wanted to rest our weather baiting bones, and bones we were to have, far too many. The fields were cleared as for a fair village, but as we walked abroad in the fields bare, we found bones lying above the ground, unburied. Is this a graveyard? Some strange charnel house for Indians? An haunted place, accursed. The sailors spake of a great mortality befell the Indians at the time of the Great Green Comet a few years ago. Elder Brewster, Master Bradford, and all spake of God's wonder work and providence clearing the way before us. Thy will, Lord, may it be done. Amen. Ah, oh, Lord. Thy will is art. We built an house for common use of all, begun on what once was called Christmas Day in Old England, a land seemed dream lost, as one by one and two and three and more our company began to fall ill. Some fell ill with the scurvy, and some fever it, and those of us as yet were well struggled to keep up with fires changing loathsome clothes, making beds, till all but a few of us lay down. Will I ever get up again? I'm so cold. My joints ache like fires live in them. Will that keep me warm? Mistress Brewster lifted me up to change the sheets. Constance? Water! She helped me to lie down. Will I die here? Did God bring me this far to die frozen? I know we're dying. Mistress Standish died right next to me. I saw her husband carry her out for burial. And clear as day, I heard a voice inside my own favorite brain. You will live, Priscilla, though many die. And when I woke from my favorite dream, and my father was dead, and I lay awake to tend or bury him or know he was ill. And when I rose from that favored bed, I too helped carry many a poor corpse out for burial at night, wrapped in their own linens, buried in secret. We knew the Indians haunted us, stealing tools into the woods and watching. The day the Indian came in March, Muller was almost too weak to stand. All the grown hale men went out to meet him. He spake us fair and broken English, said his name was Somerset, and he came from the East. And then came the Massasoit's embassy, 
to squander him in attendance upon that prince. And it was he who told us the name of this place. Patoxet. And so began the great matter between us that would decide whether we lived or died. An end full of corn kernels. Perhaps some fish. I might never stop being hungry. And as we all went out into those ghostly fields to plant that which was taken so desperately in a time when our company was twice the number that now we were, Master Jones came unto me respectfully to tell me that he had father's will aboard ship and would take it back to Old England. I knew not of father's will or intent, thanked him kindly, asked when he'd set sail. Soon, he said, we will bring you and your mother and your brother back to England, if you wish. No, I said, and minded my courtesies, thanked him again and departed. I knew neither my mother Alice nor Joe could survive another sea voyage again so soon. We buried our mother next to our father, and Joseph dragged himself out into the fields, no matter what I told him. Summer's eat came, sharp as winter's cold, but overbearing. Governor Carver fell with a pain in his head, and as he died, so did my brother. Goodman Alden and young Alwind carried Joseph out to our burying ground and laid him in earth in our best linens as I had wrapped him. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell because thou lovest me, nor yet, nor yet let thy holy one corruption for to see. Thou wilt me show the way of life where there are joys in store and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I heard their voices rising round me some off-key, some sweet, some deepening. John Alden, deeper-voiced, Bess, soaring. Mistress Winslow, keeping, setting pitch, keeping time. My brother, my cousin Peter, weeping silently. You'd known Joseph all his short life. And I knew then that I would never leave them. These folk are my family now for true. Brothers and sisters in Christ and Commonweal, how could they ask if I would go back? Go back? Do I know myself? My, my father's dreams of a country of the gospel live in me, and his dreams are fresh in my aching ears to this day. Go back? I will not go back, not turn back. On this shore of bones, I will make my life. And though all I love are covered in this New England earth, still I pray the Lord, he yet has use for the strength he gave to us who live, and whose endurance, hope, and love are shared amongst us as a common bread. As we set about building and planting, bringing in the harvest, preparing for winter, my eyes were often drawn away from work, to my friend's delight and my discomfiture. For as often as we all talked of husbands, Constance and Elizabeth and Desire and me, all knew there were more husbands to be found here than in any English village we'd known. With so many widowers, so many of our good matrons gone, children left, we all might marry well. And I knew too, that my parents would have approved a man as close as could be found to our own station. I knew that Captain Standish thought me fair, and though much older, knowing the world more, I knew my father would have approved a man of experience and station. 
And so I was always most polite, as I thought on my prospects and my honest hopes. Thinking yet again of Alice's words, remember, your choice of husband will be your joy or torment, my girl. Mind my words. And mind them I did, for my eyes were not drawn to Captain Standish, even though he was an honest, soldierly man. It was the Cooper Alden drew my gaze as he checked our stores, climbed up to thatch, best smirkin' as I glanced away. I liked the crinkle of his eyes' corners, his laugh, his nimble mind, his honesty. I saw that he was much trusted amongst us. What he was not was full of words, and though I wanted no spouter of words and wind, I wanted to hear more from him when he came with Captain Standish and such to visit Bess and I and ply our company. I knew Goodman Alden watched me too, and when there were fewer watchers about, I found him good company. But where once we were easy, now it was tension. We were youths no more, and I wished he'd speak. Let me know where I stand. Be no man's accessory. All winter this went on by the fire. At last, Constance said to me, you must speak to them. One brisk spring day, I went out walking, down by the shore, a bright Sabbath day light, praying, looking out at the say where so much had come to pass. I heard steps. John Alden approached hesitantly. Mistress Priscilla, do I disturb you? No, Goodman, you do not. Come, speak with me. He edged farther, but spake not to me. Goodman Alden, will you be visiting us? Around our earth, you are very welcome. Mistress, I am most glad to be of the company, but I would not wish to disturb you all. I have endeavored to do the true offices of a friend and neighbor. Do you understand? That you are our friend and neighbor, I do. And I would see more of you, John Alden. Mistress, I am most glad to come, but I must honor the intentions of my commander. A dam broke in my heart then, and my words flooded up, my tongue in speech. Why won't you speak for yourself, John Alden? Why do you wait for some perfect occasion? You lurk like one whose tongue is taken, like one whose tongue is taken, twisting in the wind with no passion. Tell me, do you love me so little yet that you will not lift an hopeful finger to pay court to me and risk your own bet? There are enough men here to wed times ten, and no maid can wait for doomsday's choice. You would have me as no fathers can to persuade of his vent here in trembling voice. Speak now for thyself, or fall forever silent. Myself and future cannot wait compliant. I left him up to his ankles in shifting sand, wrapping my cloak about me against the wind. Not knowing, hoping, fearing, I'd hear his, the crunch of his steps or his voice call me. His voice never called me. I kept walking. I was back home at eight near dusk when the knock came at the door. Mistress Priscilla, is she within? May I speak with her? I went out into Lighton Street proper. Would you have to say to me, you can say here? He drew a ragged breath. Mistress Priscilla, I would have you know my arts Truth and what I do intend. My intentions are most honorable, and I have long believed you my friend, true and just and kind in all our conferences. And such friendship I do truly desire, in bed and aboard and in all life's trials. What I would say, though I fare with boldness. I have too little to offer you, Priscilla. You might have any man here. And substantial, too. I am not your best offer. And I know, mistress, and I know it. However likely I may yet seem. But I do truly love thee, Priscilla. 
And if you, you will have me, I'd be thy husband. I held out my hand. Thou art indeed a likely man, John Alden. And I will have thee, as thy wife and friend. We were married by the magistrate. We find no mention of ministers presiding over weddings in the New Testament. Governor Bradford united John and I in civil bonds, as we promised to be man and wife, husband and outmate, all the days of our lives to come. I do. Despite John's fears, in, those, in days so young and rough, were none of us prosperous. Always toiling hard, watching the corn stores, striving to give dignity to quality, and our wants were general. I had John. The time came we knew we were blessed and would welcome our own little babe. All my fears that I would be left behind, that I would never again have a family to remember or to carry on after all the ones I had loved and lost and longed for. Those fears vanished and I went around smiling. But as I felt unwell and thought more deeply upon my own mother and how I never had the chance to truly know her full well, an ocean of new fears crashed in upon me. What if I were to die in childbed? Who would nurse and bring up my own baby? Which of my friends now married would help? And with John trading, fishing, striving yet, would he not have to marry again soon? My thoughts chased each other around inside my poor head. And while John's gentleness tried to calm my fears, his warm hand laid kindly on my sore back. It, it was the company of other women that my pound and art needed in that time. Good Mistress Brewster and Goody Winslow urged me to pray. For motherhood was new to me as the shores we'd landed on. And in this newly discovered land, all my assurances were in God alone. To bring life into the world is ever risk no matter how many times a mother. When my travail came and the waters broke, my friends gathered round, their arms full of linens, towels, food, broth, eggs, precious ale. Mistress Brewster and Elizabeth Hopkins took, my, took both my arms and walked me around and around again and again. And I wailed, I want John, why can't he come in? Constance and Bess dabbed sweat from my brow. I want my mother, please, Lord. Ah! You're doing well. Good girl, the babe is well placed. Ah! Ah! Susanna Winslow, guiding my hands, guiding me, helping me to crouch. Good girl, Scylla. Good girl. No, push, Scylla, push! Ah! Good girl. No, one more. Ah! And she said, You have a daughter, Priscilla. And they laid her in my arms, all swaddled. And I named her Elizabeth for my mother, and she lived. She is the first of all our tumble and brood, John Jr. and Joseph and Sarah, for my sister I'll never see again, Jonathan and Ruth, Rebecca, Mary, little David, and the next Priscilla. In each one of them, the ones who I have lost, live on a legacy to all that we fought and risked and died, buried and old in our arts in hope still faithful of the resurrection. And in you, my stars in the sky, live all my earthly hopes, my joys, my blessings, the future longed for.
My son John teases me that I am like to Solomon's mother in the book of Proverbs. My husband is known in the gates and sits with the elders of the land. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in the latter day. And I laugh. And so I ask, if a merciful and just God will hear my cry, my remembrance true, give to her the work of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. So this, this project, Desiree and I, um, and I should take this opportunity to thank Desiree for inviting me to work on this project. Desiree has known me since I was seven years old. Um, she has known me since I was running around in child size historical garb, um, <laughs> which is how I got my start, I guess. Um, and she also gave me my first ever museum job when I was 15 years old. I was a summer weekend tour guide um, at the house where uh, she was director at the time. Um, so I thank her for giving me the opportunity to give life to Priscilla of all Mayflower passengers. <laughs> um, Priscilla is probably the one who carries, of the female passengers, is the one who carries the most weight with her name. Um, and so I started, we had started talking about it about a year ago, and I decided, um, partly to make the most effective use of the grant that we received, um, but also for my own learning and my own in-depth uh, connection to Priscilla to make all the clothes myself. I do make a lot of clothing for other historical time periods, but this is the first time that I've ever done it for the early 17th century. I have studied this period a lot academically. Um, my major in college was early modern European history, so that covers 1450, 1500-ish, up through about 1800. Um, the printing press through the French Revolution, basically. And so, I had, I studied Elizabethan England, that was what I was focused on, um, and as an actor I've spent the last 15 years living with the works of William Shakespeare intensely. Um, and so that time period is really familiar to me, but I had not ever made the clothes. Um, and so what I decided to do, I should acknowledge here too um, the inspiration of another interpreter and historic costumer, um, his name is Samantha McCarty, she works at um, Historic Jamestown. A while ago, she had done, she had posted um, a, an article about a gown that she made that she called her Not a Pilgrim Dress, um, which looks, is the same style as this one, it's black, um, and it's the, the typical gown of an early 17th century middle class English woman, which is where the stereotype of pilgrim attire comes from. Um, that black was a really common color for outer clothing, but... <laughs> If you were poor or lower middling, you wouldn't be able to afford clothes that had a good black dye. You might be able to get wool from naturally black sheep um, or a, a less uh, color fast dye. To have something that is this true, as Priscilla puts it, um, true, dig true costly dignified black was a sign of wealth. Um, and so to reflect the Mullins's status as rural, um, rural townies, I guess you could say, who have, are prosperous, um, especially within their own community, but are not exalted in any way. Um, I decided to choose what would have been Priscilla's Sunday go to meeting attire, um, which it would, would have been black worsted wool. Um, so that's what I've got here. I've trimmed it. I looked at a lot of portraits from the time period, most of which depict women who are just slightly up the social scale from Priscilla. Um, but a lot of them would use black woven wool tape like this um, to decorate. There's a lot of sleeves and stripes on this. Um, and I've got some on the front, um, kind of defining the shape of the garment as well. Closes with, with hooks and eyes down the front, although it could, in many cases it was also buttoned. Um, and so that's what I decided for the outer garment to reflect upon our stereotype of what the pilgrims wear. Uh, it does come from a real place, but it doesn't look 
that much like um, the kind of fantasy depictions of Priscilla from the Victorian era that came out of Longfellow's poem. Um, and so I wanted to touch on that. And because it is now very warm, I am going to take a blackout off. Um, everything that I'm wearing, except what is right next to my skin, is made of wool. Um, which is not necessarily the problem you might think, because wool comes in a lot of different weights. You can get wool gauze if you want to. Um, but, in this case, my woolen petticoat is particularly heavy, um, because I decided to get the closest thing available to what Priscilla would have worn. Um, so the red wool that you're about to see comes from a mill in Yorkshire. Um, it's made in England. Um, just as Priscilla's would have been, England had a, a proud woolen industry in this time period. Um, it had for hundreds of years. And so everything that I'm, you can see the gown better now. Uh, it's cartridge pleated for those of you who sew. Um, that's typical for the time. Um, it's lined in linen. Um, there, there is boning in the front to help it hold its shape. And so this is uh, what at the time was usually just called a petticoat, um, sometimes called a bodiced petticoat. Uh, this is matter red. Matter is a dye plant that can make anywhere from pink to brick red um, in terms of its color. It can also make this kind of fire engine shade. What it can't do is really rich scarlets with a blue undertone. Um, that would have to be uh, from cochineal, um, which of course was very expensive. Um, so that kind of very deep scarlet was available to wealthier people. Someone of Priscilla's status or below would have been wearing a red petticoat like this. And we know from both images um, from the time and documents from um, the probate inventories of people's houses in Essex, which is another southern English county, that overwhelmingly English women uh, of every social class wore red petticoats like this. No matter what their religious affiliation was, um, up and down the social ladder, if you were poor, you'd wear a rough wool red petticoat. If you were rich, scarlet satin um, or taffeta. Um, and so this is the best representation I can give you of what Priscilla would have been wearing as a base layer every day of her life. Um, and she probably would have been wearing something like this. Fashion shifted as she got older, um, but this is what she would have grown up wearing and it's what she would have worn for decades. Um, and so the, the wool, um, as I said, comes from Yorkshire. Um, it's sold by a company called the Tudor Taylor, who are in London, um, and they are the best researchers and recreators of clothing from the 16th and early 17th century in the world. Um, and they kindly sell accurate fabric <laughs> to the rest of us. Um, it's also very common to have decoration like this around the bottom. Um, this is called guarding. Um, this is also a, a wool braid. Um, and then the bottom is bound with a different uh, tape. Um, it's also blue. Um, and so rather than turning up the hem and folding it under and stitching it, um, this is stitched over the outside um, to keep it from fraying. This is pretty heavy wool. I will say there's a lot of fabric here. So the good thing is that it stands out for my legs a little bit. Um, I'm wearing a white linen smock. Priscilla certainly would have had bleached linen because um, the Mullinses are wealthy enough um, to have quite nice clothes. Um, and so this uh, smocks, or as they later come to be called shifts, that comes in by the late 1600s and then the night in the 1800s as a chemise, um, for hundreds of years are the base layer that women wore next to their skin. They were the equivalent of a man's shirt. Both were considered underwear. They were both patterned very similarly, um, especially in this time period. Um, they're basically a series of rectangles and triangles, so they make very economical use of fabric. Um, and they would, usually in the 17th century, they come down to your wrist um, and would fasten them with a button or a tie. Um, and then you could either have a high necked one that comes up to your neck or a lower neck, which is what I'm wearing right now. But to cover up my neckline um, for both modesty, for sun protection, and also in the winter for warmth, I'm wearing a partlet, um, which is a is also linen, it's a uh, very high quality linen, um, and that ties under my arms, um, but it also hooks in the front. And those could also be made in heavy fabric. Um, they made them in black velvet um, for winter use. So that fills in the neckline. Um, and then the bodice part, um, which laces down the front, this is the support garment, um, supports my body and the weight of my skirts. Um, this is made of linen, the whole thing is, 
but the inside is stiffened with something called paste buckram. It's a fabric that has actually had a paste worked into it so it's stiff. Um, and it actually can stand up on its own. Um, that's how stiff it is. Um, and so that kind of molds to my body. Um, and it is, it is a type of corsetry, essentially. It is not as restrictive or as, um, or as shaping as whalebone corsetry would be, which was being worn by the, by the upper classes in this time period. It's a very different shape from the kind of Victorian corsets that people tend to picture. Um, they would have called them a pair of bodies, which is where bodice comes from. Um, and I also, being the daughter of a prominent shoemaker, have shoes. Um, these are actually based on uh, shoes that were found through an archaeological excavation, the excavation of the ship, the Mary Rose, um, which was wrecked in the 1540s, so it's a few decades earlier. Um, but the basic shape of the shoe stays in through into the early 17th century, and um, in some cases perhaps a little bit further. Um, they also have heels on them. Um, I did mention that she had red shoes when she was a kid, which was really common. You see them in portraits of prosperous kids. Um, so I imagine that um, Master Mullins would have made his kids some very good shoes. So, and I also, um, of course this fabric became many things, including baby Elizabeth, um, but green linen or worsted wool was actually really common for women's aprons. Um, also white, also blue, um, but they did have colored aprons. All right, do we have questions? Yeah, we do indeed, I am quite a number. Um, oh, one of them, of course, was about the shoes, which we thought was very important considering who Priscilla was. But do you want to comment on uh, what happened to the shoes that William brought over with him? Or I, They were sold, he left them to the Plymouth Company. Um, so those would have gone, one thing that I had to consider when talking about William's will, is that Priscilla likely would have had nothing to do with it. Um, that for us, that is an incredibly important historic document, but he didn't, she was not really one of the beneficiaries of it. Um, and because she was a teenage girl, um, she, was, she would have expected to receive a marriage portion or a dowry from her dad. Um, and so I don't think there's any record of this, but I don't know if, if any of the property that William brought over with him on the Mayflower was considered by Priscilla and John to be um, her marriage portion. And I have also wondered, I was looking today at the, all of the archeological um, finds from the first site, and there are spoons. There's it's in particular one spoon that is, um, it's an acorn tip um, spoon from between 1600 and 1625. So that is potentially something that could have come over that, who knows, that might be a Mullins family piece. Um, and so there might be, especially since everyone else had died, it might be that Priscilla was bringing goods like that, that the family had brought over into the marriage. Um, and that would have been a contribution towards her and John's future prosperity. Um, and unless, da marriage portions did sometimes involve cash or land uh, for the wealthy, for somebody of Priscilla's station, I think it would be more likely that her marriage portion would be what they called movable goods, uh, which would be furnishings for the house, livestock, uh, a dairy cow, chickens, um, clothing, fabric, shoes, um, potentially, since that was something they could use or sell. Um, and so I wish that we I wish that we knew a little bit more about how the Plymouth Company used William's stock of shoes. Um, but I think that because of her gender, Priscilla likely would not have been involved in administering that. Um, although, <laughs> widows did administer husbands' estates if they were named executrix, um, which I don't believe Alice was. Um, could be a reflection of her state of health, we don't know. Um, and merchants, it was, would certainly have been expected for somebody of Priscilla's station, and especially someone from a mercantile background, that if John was away, that she would act as a deputy husband, um, meaning that she would take up, could have power of attorney, and would take up his legal duties as needed in his stead. Um, that was just part of the duty of a good wife. Um, 
So it's possible that she might have had some know-how in that regard, especially since John was gone um, a lot of the time um, because of his involvement um, with Plymouth Colony's trade. But given the lack of direct documentation about how the colony disposed of the shoes, um, I didn't go further with that. Thank you, Diana. So another question um, is about, can you, and obviously a lot of her life would be based on the seasons, mm -hmm. just um, kind of give us a little overview about, you know, a, a typical day in the life of someone in Plymouth Colony in the 17th century. I think in a lot of ways it may have changed a lot over time. I think that the world she was coming for, it would have been a dramatic change from the world she came from in some ways. Um, and I, I regret to say that in the effort to keep this to a manageable time, I had to chunk out, I had to cut out various things from this performance, one of which was her description of all the things that Alice taught her about managing a house. Um, and so she would have learned when she was a girl in Dorking how to manage a household, possibly dairying since they were in a rural spot, gardening, um, probably management of small livestock like chickens and a cow and um, baby pigs. Um, and so she would have had that kind of background knowledge when she got here, probably to the level of taking care of good furniture and good clothes and managing servants because they were wealthy enough to have them. Here, <laughs> it's a very different story. She would have had to do manual labor that she was not used to doing um, as part of her upbringing. And I think it is a testament to Priscilla's physical toughness that she survived all of this. I, firstly, that she survived the winter. Um, she must have had an incredibly strong immune system and been pretty healthy already. And then to survive all of the labor that went into their daily lives, where you would be starting early. Um, probably start with, anim with the animals um, once they had them. And it did take several years for people to actually get more than chickens or goats. Um, and then for her, mornings, if it was a baking day, you would be baking bread in the morning. Their main meal was at noon. So a lot of her, the first half of her day would have, or roughly noon, um, a lot of the first half of her day probably would have involved food prep. Um, and then later on, she would be able to move on to other tasks. Um, making, so most of the clothes that they wore, most clothes would have been made by tailors in that time period, except for body linens, the stuff that you wore right next to your skin, like smocks, shirts, um, baby's diapers, um, coifs or caps. Um, and she would have covered her hair all the time. That's another thing I, I forgot to mention with the, um, with the costume is that 17th century women especially adult women, did not go out into public with their hair uncovered. Um, so there would have been making all of those um, body linens next to your skin. I will add that sewing white on white all the time is really tedious. <laughs> um, so that would have been something she had to do. Laundry would have been an all-day affair, um, and they would have done that periodically. But they would not usually be washing all of these wool outer clothing. So those would usually be spot cleaned or brushed what they would be washing and they would actually be boiling is the smocks and so on that are right next to your body and absorb all of your sweat um, and uh, dead skin and so on. That was really how they kept clean in the 17th century and how you kept good smelling if possible. And so that's also something to bear in mind aboard ship. It's a lot harder to do laundry. Uh, you can't heat the water. Um, and so coming off of, coming off of the ship, um, probably they would not have been feeling clean at all at that point. Um, and so there are some jobs like the baking, which I believe they were doing in common ovens. They didn't have them in their own houses um, for a while in Plymouth. Um, and doing laundry would not have been done every day. Um, but cooking the midday meal was. You would have to tend to your kitchen garden every day. At this time of year, you do that in the morning or the evening when it's not hot. Um, or is less hot. Um, in terms of agricultural work, I would actually have to go back to some primary sources to see how much of that kind of labor the women were helping with, because culturally, that wasn't something that English women did a ton of. They did certain things, 
like following behind the cutting of grain to pick up um, the leavings in the field. But there was a reason why that kind of work was called husbandry. Um, and Priscilla's work would have been much more focused on the house itself and its immediate environs. So she would have been outside um, a lot, but her work was, was, that was her domain, essentially. And their day would have been very, very dominated by the availability of natural light. Um, we've got a, a little Betty lamp over here on the table, um, so that could hold fat that you would put a wick in. Um, candles, which of course you're going to have to make. Um, you're going to have to have rendered animal fat and wick to do that. Um, soap um, may have been shipped to them, but they may have had to make that too. Uh, you'd also have to make lye, of course. Uh, by draining water through ashes. So I think for, when they were first, when they were first founding Plymouth, the toil would have been relentless because so many of the industries that would have supported those daily bits of life in England were not present. Some specialized things, like, they would not have had the energy to be making their own textiles here. Uh, at that point, they would have been getting fabric from England because it, you, they needed that energy and that time to survive. Um, the focus would have been on food and shelter, really, and also for the men, too, especially with John fishing and trading on paying off the colony's debt. Um, so I think that, especially early on, that toil would have been constant. As she got older, they still would have been working really hard, but they would have been settled enough that there were more resources um, for them to fall back on. So I think, I think she actually saw quite a huge change over the course of her life. So th there is a question, and again, you touched on it briefly in your introduction, um, but is there any evidence that the Elden shared in the beliefs of the Lighten separatists? There are suggestions that they may have, but one of the difficulties with knowing that for sure is that the records of the parish church in Dorking, St. Martin's, which is still standing, by the way. You can go and visit it. It's, it. The interior has been kind of Victorianized, but it's still there. It's been there since Norman times. Um, and there was a church there before it uh, in the Saxon era. That Their parish records don't survive, and so what we cannot know is whether the Mullinses were regularly attending church like they were supposed to. It was the law in Elizabethan and Jacobian England that you had to attend church on Sundays. Attendance was monitored, um, and part of the reason why that was so was not only to try and give a sense of unity to the society after decades of Reformation-related unrest, it was also to monitor who was outside the bounds of what was considered legal and acceptable by the state. Um, and so, for, for in a lot of places, um, Crypto-Catholicism or recusancy was the target of that attendance taking um, because there were plenty of people in England who had never agreed with the Reformation in the first place. And so to give a really prominent example, the family of William Shakespeare may actually have been Catholic-leaning recusants who then kind of waffled back into the Anglican Church, um, but they, did, they got fined um, several times uh, for non-attendance. In the, but the other group of people, of course, who might not want to attend a standard Church of England service were people who had Puritan leanings. Separatists had, like the Leiden congregation, had gone to the far end of the Puritan family um, and were separating themselves from the church completely. And I think nowadays, especially here in Massachusetts, we tend to use the word Puritan to describe only the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In the 17th century, that wasn't people's understanding of that movement, or, and it also wasn't how that, how that word was used. Um, for them, as Bradford, Bradford actually talks about this in a Plymouth plantation, about how the word Puritan was put on radical reforming Protestants as a label. Um, it was meant to be a pejorative. For their understanding in the 17th century, all of these avid reformers were part of the same movement. They just belonged to, there was a spectrum of involvement in it. And so you had people who were very, very openly 
uh, godly, as they would have said. That's how they would, what they would have called themselves, godly folk. Um, there were those who were still actively trying to reform the Church of England. And then on the kind of other end of that spectrum, there were people like the Leiden congregation who left um, to get away from it. In between, there were many people who had sympathies in either direction and who might be attending church on Sunday and towing the legal line, but who were privately following Puritan-leaning religious practices, praying at home, not going to the theater on Sunday afternoon if they lived in London, not playing football on Sunday afternoon, reading the Bible at home with their kids, uh, cate you know, catechizing their kids to a degree that other people didn't, um, going to prayer meetings, and Puritan-leaning prayer meetings were notorious in some cases for the amount of noise they caused because people would uh, respond really emotionally to the praying and to the preaching. Um, in some cases, they would walk to different towns to attend church if the preacher in that town was reform leaning. And there were certainly prayer groups and conversation groups in London, like I described William Mullins attending. We don't know for sure um, that he went to one of those, but the mercantile community in and around London was heavily Puritan leaning. Um, and that played a big role in English history. That's, um, well, in terms of theater history, they were always trying to shut playhouses down, <laughs> so there's that side of it. Um, but it, later on, once we get into the time of the English Civil War, the city of London in particular was avidly pro-Parliament, pro-Puritan. Um, and part of that had to do with the mercantile community of the city who were very, had, had a reforming Protestant legacy that went all the way back to Henry VIII's time. Um, and actually, for those of you who have seen the miniseries Wolf Hall that was on PBS, it's that kind of, like, the people who Thomas Cromwell would have known and their descendants are the ones that we're thinking about here. So those people who were still, in many cases, still technically going to church in the legal manner, but who were praying in a way at home in a way that they felt was acceptable, seeking out ways to learn more about their spirituality in a way that they thought was right. Um, and there is some suggestion, William Owens was called before the King's Privy Council in the 1610s, which is like being called in front of the cabinet. That's not a small thing. Um, what historians don't know for sure is whether that happened because he was involved in separatist leaning activities and was getting in trouble or because for some legal concern that had to do with his, the offices that he held. Um, I do think that in order for that, for William Owens to have been as prominent as he was, he pro they had to be going to church pretty frequently. Um, but I personally suspect that they had those leanings because of the mercantile nature of the family. And also because I think it, it would be an odd decision for somebody who did not have that kind of impulse to invest in Plymouth Colony in the way that he did. Not just in the sense that he brought all those shoes and was involved in the finances, but that he brought his entire immediate family. Um, that speaks to me of, of both of the financial desire to colonize the new world, which I think is important and is absolutely there, but I also think that there was an additional drive behind that, and the obvious answer to that is the religious leanings. and comments um, about the enslaved native in your presentation. Yes, up and out. And um, how, you know, if you would like to go ahead and share a little bit more about that. Yeah, so up and out, um, obviously, is a real person. He was from um, what is now Martha's Vineyard. Um, and there is some evidence that he did later become a sachem. He was taken, there were several expeditions, English expeditions specifically, that captured Wampanoag people from the shores of the Cape and Islands and Plymouth, um, Patuxet, in the early 1600s. That happened multiple times over the course of about 15 years. And the most famous person to be taken captive in that manner was Squanto, or to Squantum, um, or Squantus. All three of those are acceptable variants. 
And so he was captured later on from Patuxet, and then of course famously returned home to discover that his entire family had been, his entire village had been wiped out by the plague in between 1616 and 19. Epineau um, has, I think in many ways, a happier story because, um, because he was taken captive and the goal of the English captain who took him was to sell him into slavery in Spain. So this was a slave trading raid. He was taken with several men um, from Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and from coastal Maine. Um, so Wampanoag people and um, Wabanaki people. They were taken to Spain. The Spanish didn't want to buy them um, because they felt that native people didn't make great slaves. And so he was shipped on to London where he kind of fell into the hands, I would say, of two different upper-class Englishmen who had a lot of interest in the New World, one of whom was a guy named Sir, Sir Ferdinando Gorges, who was involved um, in the foundation of Plymouth, and who were exploratory-minded, colonial-minded um, investors, if you will, in colonial projects. And so he lived in London with another, Epineau was housed in London, kind of under the captivity slash patronage. Um, it's difficult to tell exactly what their legal relationship was at this point, um, of these men who had an interest in coastal New England. And he was living with a Wabanaki guy from Maine who helped him to learn English. And he was displayed in London as a wonder um, which was a common practice at the time to put a native person or, you know, somebody later on, this goes into what in Victorian times would be called a freak show, um, somebody who had some extraordinary feature um, out on public display for people to come and gawk at. Um, and there are multiple accounts of Epinau being put on public display in London and people, he was a big, well-built person. Um, Native people tended to be larger on average and healthier than English people were, so people were coming to gawk at his physique. Um, and he had learned enough English, apparently, to say, welcome, welcome to people who were coming to see him. And Shakespeare makes one, two probable references to him, one in The Tempest and one in Henry VIII. Um, so his presence there is actually pretty well documented. One of the people who he knew, who had been captured with him, actually, who was from Nantucket, actually wound up fighting for the armies of the Habsburgs in the Thirty Years' War. Um, so, like, all of these stories of Native people who have been taken captive and what happened to them, there's multiple movies in this, really. Um, but Epinau managed to, he, he was taken back to Martha's Vineyard as a translator, because he had now learned English, on an expedition financed by Sir Ferdinando Gorges. Once he got there, a bunch of Wampanoag people rode out to meet the ship, a bunch of them were his relatives, and he made an escape plan with them because he was the only person on the ship who could speak Wampanoag. Um, and when the time came, uh, the English were afraid he was going to try and escape, so they put him in a long robe so that they could grab him if he tried to jump. He jumped anyway. He jumped off the side of the ship, and because he was a big guy, they couldn't stop him and he swam to shore while his relatives covered his escape with arrow fire. And there he stayed, um, advocating for, in many cases, anti-English policy uh, as a result of his experience. He became a, a leader, probably a sachem. Um, and when the pilgrims arrived, which is a few years after his return, he was one of the local leaders under Massasoit's the Massasoit's leadership. Massasoit is actually a title. Um, his real name is Usamequin. Um, so he was under Usamequin's leadership and was, was probably alongside Squanto advising him on foreign policy with the English. He was not terribly friendly um, to the English because of his experience. So yeah, that's his story. Diana, how do you think um, the children were educated? What's your thought on that, given the challenging times and pretty much, um, you know, the limited opportunities for um, to have a teacher till for a while? For John and Priscilla's kids, mm -hmm. it's an interesting question because Plymouth didn't have schools for quite some time. Um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony established very 
organized education pretty quickly. Um, that was part of their legal system. Plymouth Colony didn't. Um, so I think my guess would be, given who the Aldens tended to grow up to be, like given the level of civic involvement in this family, which I think is impressive, and the their tendency to become pillars of the community, as well as their prosperity, I suspect that one or both of, of either John or Priscilla or both were educated enough themselves to teach the kids, especially because they moved out of Plymouth in relatively quickly to come out here to Duxbury, um, so that, you know, more diffused, not in, not in the village. It would have been really hard to send them to, some, to someone to be taught. Maybe there was a neighbor um, who was more educated and who, say, was running a dame school where little kids would come in and learn to read. That's possible. Um, but I think it's more likely that they were taught at home. If that was the case, the likely person to have done it is Priscilla, because that was considered to be a woman's job, especially in reforming Protestant kind of circles. It was, re it was frequently considered to be the mom's job to teach the kids to read, to catechize them, um, they don't have the New England primer yet at this point, but they would have had, you know, Elder Brewster, and once they had a minister, would have been able to instruct her in what she should teach them. Um, and to give them that very basic education, it would fuel their religious education. That, that's the idea behind all this. New England has a really high literacy rate for most of its early period because they wanted people to be able to read the Bible. Um, it's possible that... Priscilla could, given the mercantile background, have had some education in ciphering, so in basic math, um, but probably not in writing it down. She probably would have been doing it mentally. Um, I suspect that she couldn't write since no records have turned up with her signature, but I could be wrong. It could be just that the documents don't exist. So if they were learning to write, which would be more likely for the boys, that probably would have been John teaching them. Given that John was also a tradesman, he may also have learned to both read and write, to cipher, and to keep records for his business, to keep an account book. So he might have been teaching them those skills. Could you, and I know you covered this a little bit in your introduction, but could you just touch again very quickly on, because there have you know, been a few comments about this, um, about why you chose, um, you know, your, the mother that you chose and how, you know, you came to um, make that it more of this, in a historic fiction approach? I think uh, it, largely because there is no factual answer to it. Um, and when, when you are dramatizing history like this, and you have to, and that, like, that's not a gap that I could really leave empty. Who somebody's mother is is a huge aspect of their life. Um, and so I had to make some kind of choice. Given the... Uh, I think one of the big pointers is that the age gap between Priscilla and Joseph. That's not definitive, but it could tell us something. Um, there are birth records going up. For the, there's the two older kids. There's William and Sarah. There was also a baby named Elizabeth who probably died young, who shows up. At, she was baptized in the late 1590s. And Priscilla would have been born in about 1602 or 3. Um, and then there's a gap before we get to Joseph. Which suggests to me that there was perhaps a maternal death in the middle and then a remarriage. There's also the hypothesis, which of course is also unprovable, that part William's purchase of the Four Bay House in Dorking may have been enabled in part by Mary and Alice. But we don't know enough about her to know for sure. Um, so in terms of making that dramatic choice, I made it because it enabled me to discuss things that are important to 17th century women's lives. Partly it was just an emotional instinct, but having, having lost a mother and then being raised by a stepmother both made Priscilla's eventual motherhood more poignant and enabled me to really bring up the subject of maternal mortality. Um, it also would have been a really common experience for people at the time. Uh, losing your mom was not unusual. Um, and being raised by somebody who was not your biological mom was also not unusual. So all of those experiences 
were very much a part of many people's lives at the time. And making that choice enabled me to depict an experience that was really common in Priscilla's world, even though we don't know for sure historically that that was true. Um, and again, like this is this is fiction. Um, it's not possible because of the lack of documentation to stand up and give a fully factual step-by-step -step account of Priscilla's life. But if we want to watch a satisfying dramatic presentation, we need to fill in those gaps. Diana, thank you so much. Um, I know we're approaching our, our time now. Is there anything else that you would like to add um, before we close? One thing I was thinking about earlier today, I went down, to, I went for a walk um, to the first site and I was thinking as I walked back and as I was getting ready to do this, that for all of you who are watching this, Priscilla risked her life 10 times over to ensure that all of you could exist. Um, Every time that she gave birth, she would have known that there was a possibility she wouldn't survive. Um, so that is something about her experience that really strikes with me. Um, I think there's, for 17th century women, having kids was in many ways the fulfillment of their, their life purpose and their identity um, as women and as Christians. So I think that for her, giving birth to everyone who were your ancestors was the center of, of her identity in a lot of ways. Um, and also was a triumph every time because she had lost so much. And so in thinking about her experience, the, the generosity and the love that, is, that I think is in that um, is really, really powerful to me. And also just being here in the house today, I can, she is a very strong presence, even though we don't know that much about her personally. Um, and she does have what I think, uh, to quote the, the famous early New England women's history um, scholar, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, well-behaved women rarely make history. Um, if you're a good girl, you don't make it into the records. Uh, and I think that's one reason why we don't have a lot of written records about Priscilla. She was a, a good 17th century wife and mom um, by the standards of her own culture. But that doesn't mean that she wasn't strong or that she didn't have a, a really distinctive personality. And I think that strength underlying is something that I can feel here in the house now, sitting here. So I am very thankful to have been able to be Priscilla for 40 minutes. <laughs>